don't want to take up any more time, I would like to introduce our next speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce Alan Stahl. He's curator of numismatics at Princeton University, and he will be speaking on a subject that is fascinating to me, the allegorical representations of Lady Liberty. So without more ado, Mr. Stahl. Are you familiar with the just forward and backward? Forward and backward. Easy enough. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and especially to those who organized it. I'm interested that you said Lady Liberty, whereas I said Representations of America, and that will be a theme here, how these ideas and identities get intertwined between America, Liberty, Columbia, fame, and various other things get mixed in. Libertas Americana. This is where we will begin our discussion of the representation of America on medals, with the most famous issue of the series generally regarded as the beginning of American medals, those authorized by the Continental Congress and its successors. Due to the limitation on minting in America, these medals were designed and struck by the Paris Mint. Though bearing the date 1776, 1777, 1781, the Libertas Americana medal was minted in 1783 following negotiations between Benjamin Franklin and French artists and mint officials. This Princeton example is an original bronze striking gilt at an unknown time. The obverse portrays the goddess Liberty with the pileus cap on a staff behind her. The reverse portrays Minerva bearing a shield with the arms of France holding off a lion from attacking the infant Hercules who is entangled with snakes. Three medals of the Comitia Americana series represented in Princeton by bronze lead casts show three heroes of the revolution affronting a bare-breasted woman with an Indian bonnet, in two cases receiving a laurel crown of victory, and in the third, a palm branch, also a classical symbol of victory. In all three cases, the Indian woman has a shield with 13 vertical stripes by her feet, accompanied by an alligator in the case of the Stony Point medals, and in the cow pens, one a, a fasces a trumpet and cannons and standards. The final medal in the series is the Diplomatic Medal, instituted by Thomas Jefferson to serve as rewards for foreign officials who had aided the revolution, and produced in France three years after the French Revolution led to the end of many of the officials who were to receive gold examples. The Princeton specimen is one of only three known struck bronze examples from the original striking. You may be familiar with the much later restrike version. On the obverse is the great seal of the United States with the wings of a displayed eagle, which I might note was adap adopted by Congress in 1782 while it was meeting in Nassau Hall on Princeton's campus. The reverse depicts the Indian princess seated seated holding a cornucopia, which is a symbol of plenty and will get attached to the symbol of America, with Mercury holding his caduceus, a, stag with, a staff with entwined snakes, again will become associated with America and surrounded by the implements of commerce. And Mercury is generally taken as a symbol for commerce. Many of the symbols on these medals can be traced back to classical mythology and to ancient coins. The figure of liberty with a hat and staff goes back to the Roman practice of manumission, in which a slave was touched with a staff at the moment of liberation and given a specific hat to wear as the sign of being a freed man. The hat in question was the pileus, derived from that worn by the twins, or Dioscuri, Castor, and Pollux, who were the offsprings of a union between Jupiter and later the swan. They, of course, hatched from eggs, 
and as they emerged from the eggs, the top of the egg stuck to their head and became their cap, the distinctive pileus cap of the Dioscuri, which then becomes the liberty cap. On a bronze coin of southern Italy of the second century BC, we see the Dioscuri with their egg cap on the obverse and Hermes or Mercury holding his attribute, the caduceus, which is the staff with the snakes, on the reverse. The story that we see depicted on the Libertas Americana medal of Hercules, Minerva, and the snakes goes back, as many classical myths do, to the domestic quarrels among the gods. In this case, Juno was so jealous of Hercules, another offspring of Jupiter, that she sent snakes to attack the infant Hercules, attack the infant. Hercules strangled the serpents while Minerva protected him from Juno's wrath. Minerva, or Athena in Greek, is recognized in classical imagery as a helmeted woman with a spear and shield. She's often accompanied by her owl. The eagle was the symbol of the Roman army, carried on standards into battle, as was the fasces, a bundle of twigs, you see behind the figure on the reverse, a bundle of twigs bound together for straight strength, which often had an ax protruding from the top. It doesn't in this example. Okay, now getting into the early modern adaptations of these images. These classical elements are joined with the depiction of a Native American as images of America on medals of early modern Europe. The Indian maiden appears originally as a symbol of America following the classical and Renaissance practice of representing continents by allegorical figures with distinctive attributes to differentiate them. In this early Spanish medal, the Yama accompanying the woman identifies her as representing the American continents. Liberty with her cap and staff became a common feature on Dutch medals at the time of their revolt for in independence from Spain. Here the cap is given a contemporary Dutch appearance. On a French medal dated 1666, but actually produced and designed in 1702, the expulsion of the English from the colony of St. Christopher on Kitts Island is represented by an Indian maiden holding a French shield with the British shield at her feet. On an English medal of 1702, made in the Netherlands, as most English medals were in this period, Hercules represents England stepping on a dragon, and he rescues the golden fleece from its guardian, holding a French standard. An Indian of uncertain gender with a bow and arrow walks by palm trees and an alligator in a 1751 jeton that proclaims French colonies as growing under all constellations. So we, here we see the Indian palm tree and alligator symbols of the southern United States, part of the New World, and the constellation, the new constellation holy, appearing on this piece. On a 1752 Jetton celebrating French colonies in America as creating commerce in both worlds, Mercury, with his distinctive winged hat and caduceus, flies over the oceans. Two male Indians holding the club of Hercules flank a palm tree on another French jetton of the period. On an independently produced German medal of 1755, Mercury appears on the obverse as a symbol of commerce, being protected by the fleets of Ireland and France. And on the reverse, an Indian with an alligator between his feet faces a seated crowned woman with a scepter and temple of fame in her hands and cornucopia at her feet. 
a Dutch medal of 1762 for the secret meeting of Fontainebleau by which Fran Spain ceded Louisiana to France, depicts Mercury with the Pileus and staff, a palm and cornucopia on the obverse, and an Indian beside a small cupid holding a figure of peace on the reverse. A badge of 1766 for William Pitt, who was viewed as a friend of the American colonies, depicts a liberty cap on the tip of a sword behind the shaking hands of Britain and America. That was a short-lived image. Once the American Revolution was victorious, Several medals were produced in the Netherlands to welcome the United States to the small world of independent republics. In fact, I think in this period, the only other independent republic in the world, other than the Dutch Republic, was the Venetian Republic. On maybe, maybe, we'll have to check that, Paul. On one Minerva, Minerva represents Holland, so these people can go back and forth. Minerva isn't always one country or the other. Even with the liberty cap, the Dutch thought they were the holders of liberty. So she's, Minerva with the liberty cap represents Holland on this one. And obviously it's the Indian maiden, although she's not so Indian looking by the standards of the headdress, which of course was inappropriate for a woman anyway. An Indian maiden holding a shield of stars, therefore she is America. With a Dutch style liberty cap, flanking an altar with the caduceus of mercury symbolizing commerce and the cornucopia symbolizing plenty. The Indian maiden is crushing a lion, which always represents England, beneath her feet. Another medal for the same occasion as the female figure of Holland, seated with the Pileus and staff behind her, receiving an olive branch of peace from a male figure, identified as America by the flag he bears, and the barrel of corn, that is American corn, not wheat, behind him. This is one of the few male allegorical figures of America we shall encounter. In general practice in the classical world, allegorical figures were female. A caduceus is on the reverse behind laurel and palm branches symbolizing victory. On a medal of the province of Friesland or Frisia for the same occasion, an armed Frisian man turns to an Indian maiden with a scepter and chains at her feet, about to receive a Dutch hat from Cupid as he turns away from a figure of Great Britain with a leopard to her left and a serpent behind her shield. A German medal for the Peace of Versailles, which we commonly know as the other Libertas Americana medal, shows Louis XVI of France pointing out a shield of 13 horizontal stripes hanging on a pillar topped with a Dutch liberty hat to a draped female with no identifying attributes. On the reverse, Minerva holds the shield of the main European powers, and on the ground is the Aegis, which is the shield of Minerva, which bears the head of the slain Medusa. On the obverse of a German medal of the same year, America to the right with her hat, staff, and shield shakes hands with peace, while peace reigns alone on the reverse, trampling a soldier and holding an olive branch and cornucopia. A cupid flying above bears the wreath of victory and the trumpet of fame. On a crude white metal piece from the same year, a dove flies from the, a seated Britannia to an armed Indian maiden on the obverse in front of a landscape of London, while the reverse bears the linked chain of American states that had first appeared on paper notes of 1776 printed by Benjamin Franklin. 
Now, you can wonder how Franklin and Jefferson knew all these symbols when they started negotiating with the French Academy for how to represent the various things on the Comitia Americana medals. Well, it's not necessary that they did know all the ancient coins and medals, although the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia by this period had quite a good collection of ancient coins, and I think also some recent medals. Uh, on the one hand, the Académie des Inscriptions in France was founded and charged with the specific purpose of inventing allegorical images, and they certainly knew the whole canon of appropriate symbols. On the other hand, there were these popular books, such as this one, Antiquity Explained, which I think was in Jefferson's library and certainly available to Franklin as well, that explained all the various classical imagery. And here we see uh, the various images of liberty being depicted here. Here again we see the classical images of Hercules, such as the one at the top right, which could have served as the model for the reverse of the Amer Libertas Americana. So the Libertas Americana medal was totally within the classical repertory of allegorical images. The diplomatic medal included a combination of classical and more recent motifs. The obverse seal combines the heraldic eagle with the shield of 13 stripes and 13 arrows and 13 arrows, as well as the new firmament of stars of the new world skies. The depiction of the heraldic eagle was well known through not so much books of classical antiquities, but emblem books, very popular in the 16th century and on into the 17th and 18th. And here we see, as a symbol, the eagle with the spread heraldic wings, the thunderbolt, and olive branch in his talons from a book published in 1712. Now on the reverse of the diplomatic medal, we see the Indian maiden, which was an invention of the early modern period as a symbol of America. And here she shares the scene with the classical mercury symbolizing commerce, as well as contemporary images of ships and an anchor. The awards to individual soldiers of the Comitia Americana series placed the Indian maiden into a modern rather than an allegorical setting and avoided classical imagery beyond the wreath and palm, both symbols of victory. Moving past the revolution. Much of the imagery of the ancient coins and earlier medals continued on the medallic tradition of the 19th century. On one of the first medals actually produced in the New Republic, Minerva is seen holding the staff in Pileus, greeted by an eagle bearing a laurel wreath with a cornucopia among the images of war, including the fasces, that bundle of twigs that was one of the symbols of the Roman army. So we, we're combining a whole repertory of classical symbolism relating to America, to liberty, to strength, A figure of a woman with staff and cap crowns a bust of George Washington on a medal of 1805. Though by this period, it's not certain whether this allegorical figure of a woman represents America or liberty or some combination of the two. On a later piece attributed to Moritz Furtz, known only from uniface trials, the bust of Washington is flanked by a male Indian with bow and a classically dressed female wearing a helmet and holding a spear. Her identity is not clear. She, the helmet is certainly not that of Minerva. 
on the reverse of another first piece, an allegorical female figure representing America holds a staff and shield with stars and stripes and crowns a military trophy. On another first medal, known only from uniface shells, the seated figure appears with the balances and swords of justice, another attribute, allegorical attribute, the balance always indicates justice, but she's flanked by an eagle and shield with a plowshare and ears of American corn behind. None of these pieces is the figure specifically identifiable as America or liberty. The reverse legend of the John Quincy Adams Medal by First declares that science gives peace in America plenty, which it illustrates with Minerva presenting an olive branch to an Indian seated, sitting on a cornucopia. Presumably Minerva represents science or wisdom, but the eagle rather than the owl behind her suggests that she represents America as well, as of course does the Indian. The prize medal for the American Institute by first had America represented with attributes of the staff and cap, the eagle, the shield, the caduceus, and the cornucopia. There are also representations of contemporary objects of industry and commerce. On a later medal by first, a figure of Minerva holding a scale and sword is associated with France by the rooster at her feet while the male Indian receiving a purse from Cupid holds a fasces rather than his usual bow and arrow. On a medal of C.C. Wright for the American Art Union, the allegorical figure of America is identified only by the striped shield she leans on. A medal of Wright in honor of Daniel Webster illustrates his characterization of America in terms of liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable, with the very original image of a Doric column with a globe atop. The only traditional imagery re representing America is the shield beneath at the tie of the wreath. On a Tiffany medal for the laying of the Amer Atlantic cable, an Indian maiden with an eagle personifies America, while Minerva with a lion represents England. A medal by, by Paquet for Civil War victories of General Grant bears a floating image identified as America by her shield and cornucopia. On the ground is an assemblage of military trophies topped by a cap and distinctive folk a cap with a distinctive fold at the top. Let's see if we can point that out. Well, you see, just below the shield is that cap. Somehow, the egg-shaped cap of the Dioscuri, which was the classical representation of li liberty, has become this longer cap after having been a Dutch cap, which has nothing to do with either, has become this long cap with the fold, which is actually in antiquity known as the Phrygian cap and has nothing to do with liberty. It's the cap worn by Phrygians who are barbarians in Central Asia. On the reverse of Paquet's Indian Peace Medal of 1865, an Indian in a classical cloak with traditional native implements behind him shakes hands with a classically robed woman holding a United States flag with modern objects at her feet and a little train running behind her. On a life-saving medal by Paquet, the long-haired figure crowning the sailor in the reverse is identified as America by the eagle atop Fasces at her side. William Barber's Centennial Exposition Medal contrasts the America of 1876 on the obverse, identified by her shield and with a sword tucked behind her, 
crowning representations of industry and art, with the America of 1776 on the reverse, with her sword drawn, motioning to the firmament of 13 stars. At, on Oscar Roti's medal for commemorating the gift of the Statue of Liberty from France to the United States, the woman in the boat with stars circling her forehead has to represent America. So the one with the Phrygian cap is the image of Marianne, a symbol of France that Roti was introducing at that period onto the French coinage. The Cupid in the boat likewise sports a Phrygian cap. Now it's with this medal, and of course the construction of the Statue of Liberty, that the Statue of Liberty begins to replace all the old allegorical figures as the figure of America. Now the figure of liberty designed by Bertoldi was based on the classical figure of a, the male sun god Helios, the distinctive attribute being the radiant crown. Now here on this Roman coin, he holds a globe symbolizing the earth, which gets replaced by the torch in the Statue of Liberty, which then again becomes a symbol of America. The large bronze cast medal of Augustus St. Gordon's for the centennial of Washington's death used the fasces on the obverse and the eagle on the reverse as stark, simple images to represent America. On his design, on his, that is St. Gordon's design for the reverse of the Columbian Exposition Prize Medal, St. Gordon's chose to represent America on the reverse as a male youth holding a torch made from fasces, combining the torch now with the fasces, and a shield with an eagle, an American shield, and a laurel branch on it. Notice there's a shield on a shield there. Now, as you all know, that was rejected for various reasons. The adopted revised ver reverse by Barber kept the flaming fasces and added two winged female figures with no specific American attributes that I can identify. One has the horn of fame A souvenir medal of the exposition has its, on its reverse two allegorical figures. The standing one has something on her head that might either be an Indian headdress or the radiant crown of the Statue of Liberty, while the seated one holds the American, holding the American shield has a turreted crown. Now a turreted crown, that is a crown representing the walls of a city, in classical imagery always represents a city. So that she may, the seated figure may be representing Chicago. The e eagle flies above a rising sun whose rays recall those on the firmament of stars on earlier medals, as well as the crown of the Statue of Liberty. And it's in this period that the rising sun becomes a symbol of America, whether it's derived from the radiant crown of the Statue of Liberty or the older image of the firmament of new, the new firmament, that is the stars as seen from the Western Hemisphere, is not easy to determine. Another Colombian medal depicts on its obverse an Indian man representing America grasping hands with a woman who is probably supposed to be Europe with an eagle below the bust of Columbus and a globe above. On the complex scene of the reverse, a winged female with a star above her head is borne aloft by cupids holding respectively a torch, a caduceus, and a cornucopia, the whole scene observed by an Indian below with a rising sun behind. On the award medal for the Pan American Exposition of 1901, there are two symbolic Indians on the obverse, the one on the left representing South America in Incan garb, and the one on the right representing North America. While the nude female with a billowing drape probably represent, on the reverse probably represents America in general, and the buffalo probably represents buffalo.
On the Louisiana Purchase Medal of A.A. A. Wyman, the fully clothed woman on the left of the front wears the Phrygian cap, so she presumably represents liberty, and she's wrapping a woman on the right, presumably America, with a flag that is presumably the American flag. The rays of the rising sun behind them also probably represent America. The eagle on the reverse likewise represents America, but the meaning of the dolphins and the scallop shell are unclear. The dolphins on classical coinage represent the city of Syracuse in Sicily. On Victor Brenner's medal for the repatriation of the remains of John Paul Jones, the reverse legend declares that America claims her illustrious dead, but the allegorical figure has the wings and laurel wreath of victory rather than America, and the horn, which represents fame. The figure directing Lewis and Clark toward the rising sun on an exposition medal of 1905 is wrapped in the American flag and wears a Phrygian cap. And maybe Ira can help me on this one because it was really difficult. On the obverse of Isidore Conti's 1905 medal for the 250th anniversary of Jewish settlement in the United States, the upright figure on the obverse has been identified, I think, by Ira as liberty, and the seated one as justice. But the pagan attributes of these figures are avoided. On the reverse, America is represented by an eagle hovering above a woman bearing a scroll who has been identified as representing history. The figures on the obverse of Emil Fuchs's 1906 medal for the Hispanic Society of America represent literature and art seated before a rising sun. The turreted woman on the reverse instructing a youth may represent New York. Remember, turreted is supposed to mean city. And it is the Statue of Liberty in the distance who represents America, seen very dimly on the reverse. On his medal for Carl Schurz, the figure of America who leads the young immigrant is a nude male, sort of recalling the St. Gordon's one. Both figures are approaching a rising sun. The figure on the reverse of Juanet's medal for Grover Cleveland with a Phrygian cap and holding a globe and tablet has been identified as representing democracy. The female on the obverse of Godefroy de Vries's medal for the International Metallic Ex Exhibition of 1910 wears a Phrygian cap and holds a laurel or olive branch and American flag, so probably represents America or Colombia as the figure was becoming called. The figure on the reverse riding an eagle bears a torch whose beams contain the word liberty. The association of the torch with liberty derives from the modern statue of that name rather than any ancient or classical tradition. Reaching up on the obverse? I don't know. That's us. Appreciating medals, what could be better? Another new representation of America is in the guise of Uncle Sam, appears on the medals of Carl Goertz, who derived much of his imagery from popular culture rather than from classical typologies. Uncle Sam takes on the guise, if you look carefully at his face, of President Wilson affronting a serpent and entwined in a palm branch on this Goertz 1907 medal, satirizing Wilson's so-called successes with the neutral nations. Paul Manship's Art War Relief Medal presents a figure of America brandishing a sword with an eagle and rising sun behind it. On René Baudichon's medal for the end of the war, victorious America is depicted as the Statue of Liberty rising from the waves with a sword held high. The statue peeks out from a sea of banners above an eagle on the medal of Uthwaite for the 
for the same occasion. On a medal for the visit of Maréchal Foch to the United States in 1921 by Cyrus Dallin, America wears a Phrygian cap and holds a striped shield. Where, while on one by Robert Aitken for the same occasion, she appears as winged victory with a radiant crown. On a prize medal at the New York Times contest on the Constitution of the United States, America is represented by a young maiden with a laurel wreath who ties together a fasces containing axe in front of a map of the country. America appears with her fasces and miniature shield with an eagle atop as well as a cornucopia on the right on this rigidly neoclassical and we could even say proto-fascistic using the term literally medal by John R. Sinek for Calvin Coolidge's inauguration of 1928. Laura Garden Fraser's image of America or Liberty of 1932 appears with stars, an eagle, torch, sword, and radiant crown. Now finally, a new medallic image for America appears on the Eisenhower inaugural medal of Roberts and Gasparo in the form of a, the statue atop the U.S. Capitol building sculpted by Thomas Crawford in 1863, in which the personification of freedom holds a sword and sports a headdress made of an eagle's head and feathers, reminiscent of the Hercules wearing a lion's head, which is a classical motif. This depiction appeared again on Neil Harris's Bicentennial Medal for the state of Indiana. Representations of America on the official medal of the Bicentennial by Frank Gasparro consists of a literal representation of the Statue of Liberty on the obverse and the Great Seal on the reverse. One of the few medals since then to attempt a symbolic representation of America is that of the State of Israel for the Columbus Quincentenary which accompanies the Statue of Liberty with images of New York buildings and as a final indignity, a bottle of Coca-Cola. <laughs> the rich visual symbolic reper repertory of images from classical antiquity and the European artistic tradition apparently no longer speak to the modern medallic artist or public. Thank you. It's for questions. Okay, uh, Ira. Earlier medals, you ascribe the selection of the visualization to the patrons. In the latter medals, you ascribed it to the artists. I wonder how much evidence there is along the way in general in this grand sweep, which was fantastic, you have about who decides what's going to be put on these medals and who's going to decide what symbols are going to be used. Okay, well, for the Committee Americana, as we well know from John Adams's careful research, we know the process and we have the letters of uh, Jefferson especially, but also from Franklin, of the negotiation for what would go on. And artists would suggest something, and then it would get sent across the Atlantic, if they, unless they were in Paris at the time, and the negotiation would go on. Uh, in later periods, again, that's research that needs to be done. Uh, you may recall, and Scott and Steve Schur, when the ANS did its uh, bicentennial medal, most of the designs came in with the Statue of Liberty. And we said, the Statue of Liberty has nothing to do with the American Revolution. And we had to look pretty far to find someone who had some vision of the American Revolution that didn't include anachronistic imagery like the Statue of Liberty. John, did you? Earlier, you had uh, the Felicitas Britannia medal up on the screen. Uh, 
have you figured out what's going on on that one? I'm not sure how easily I can get back to it. What's the year of that? No, I want to be further. This one? No. Oh, this one. This one. Well, there's clearly an Indian. There's a seated Briton by the sh from the shield. Uh, a dove with peace flying overhead and England in the background. Yeah, the, the end, symbolizing the end of the revolutionary conflict. And again, I think we know nothing about this piece other than it shows up in Betts's book and there are a couple examples of it floating around. Other questions? Suggestions. Wait, 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 Paul, wait for the mic. I was going to say, it, it's kind of a mule and it may be that someone prepared the obverse and, and it didn't have a reverse and just joined it with something that was floating about in the colonial period. Yeah, could be. Because the reverse actually is a revolutionary symbol and doesn't really fit with the, with the peace proclaimed on the obverse. Okay, Ira again. Wait, 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 wait. Mike? One of your earlier medals, I, it's a couple of ones back, um, that, that medal has a flag that looks remarkably modern. Um, and I wondered how far back flags of America appear. Is that the earliest representation of an American type? Okay. Tony Terranova says that's Thank you. the earliest depiction. Now, Okay. And the first appearance of the stars in that arrangement, the first appearance came up at 1777. So that medal's dated 1782. So. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, what, one thing that interested me is the 13 stripes on the shield go much further back. And sometimes they're horizontal and sometimes they're vertical. But the 13 stripes always indicates the 13 colonies. But it, didn't become colony 13 until fairly soon before the revolution, right? So it's a fairly tight period in there. We have time for one more, if we have one more? We have one more. In your explanation of all the symbology, I, I'm, I'm trying to keep track of what the sword with the snakes. Could you describe where that came from and what it represents? Uh, it ultimately goes back to that myth of Hercules being born and wrestling with snakes uh, sent by uh, Juno, and pro he's protected by Minerva, who has a sword. Uh, now, how the snakes, I mean, I know we have some physicians in the office, how the, the caduceus, which is the staff with snakes, which is also the symbol of Mercury, gets associated with America, I think is mainly through the idea of commerce bringing prosperity to America. But again, Ira has a... One thing about snakes is that they're evil. So the snake with Hercules is evil, snakes that are trampled on the feet are evil, snakes on the conspiracy things are evil. But the snake on the caduceus of uh, Escalipius is because the snake sheds his skin and therefore is thought to recreate, to be immortal. If a snake comes out of his old skin and, re and revives, that's the, also the snake that goes around in a circle, also represents continuity. So snakes mean okay. different things in different contexts. Good. Okay, and I think Anne wants to take the podium back. Thank you very much.